you are listening to my favorite talk show, the BG Show with Aditya. Drew McIntyre, after defending his world championship against the most cerebral of wrestlers, finally ran out of steam when he lost the set tight Randy Orton, who is now just two more titles of equalizing with John Cena and Ric Flair and with both Cena and Ric Flair in that retirement group. With John Cena no longer an active wrestler and other wrestlers way behind him as far as winning the number of championships are concerned and with age behind him, it could be something historic that may happen if Randy Orton eclipses John Cena and Ric Flair's tied 16 world titles to go beyond them. Can he do that? Yes, he has a chance. Who would be his potential opponent who would stop him as far as getting to that record is concerned? Well, there are a couple of good wrestlers who are in contention to win a world championship title which includes the individual who he beat for that title, Drew McIntyre, plus Bray Wyatt in his alter ego as The Fiend along with former champions such as AJ Styles, Sheamus, even Kofi Kingston. That's a long way to go. For now, the focus would be on the next pay-per-view which is a little different from most pay-per-views because this is a pay-per-view event which focuses on inter-brand rivalry, which means that even though they are in the same arena, the same stadium, the same venue, both the brands, wrestlers of both the brands, they will be wedding one another, trying to show which brand is the mightiest. So, there could be a temporary alliance between the likes of Braun Strowman, Randy Orton, AJ Styles, Jeff Hardy, Drew McIntyre because it becomes about saving the brand, saving Raw vs Smackdown. And since the Survivor Series is an inter-brand rivalry pay-per-view which means the champions of both the brands will face each other. So if Roman Reigns and Randy Orton retain their respective title till the next pay-per-view which is only three weeks away, we could see Randy Orton, the world heavyweight champion against Roman Reigns, the universal heavyweight champion, the WWE Raw Tag Team Champions, that is the New Day versus the Steve Profits, that is the WWE SmackDown Tag Team Champions, the Women's SmackDown Champion Sasha Banks versus the Women's Raw Champion, that is Asuka, with Bobby Lashley, the United States Champion, who is drafted on Raw, versus Sami Zayn, the Intercontinental Champion, drafted on SmackDown. And the Drew McIntyre Randy Orton match wasn't the only championship match which saw a title change. There was even the Sasha Banks Bailey match, the former become the SmackDown Women's Champion. Also, there were a few other surprises as far as the matches are concerned, a few non title matches, a match for the Money in the Bank winner. As far as the Survivor Series goes, there is a 5-on-5 elimination match for both men and women. But before that is decided, there is the customary scenes where both the brands weigh each other, trying to show which is the superior brand. And with Seth Rollins and Dominic Mysterio along with Rey Mysterio, Murphy, Roman Reigns all drafted to SmackDown and they have their own rivalry between them. You might see them come together as far as defending SmackDown as a brand is concerned. So anything is possible in WWE and this is the only pay-per-view in which 
it's an inter-brand rivalry, which means that if in Raw there are two wrestlers who have had their Twitter rivalry for months, you might see them team together temporarily. Same thing on the other brand. And this temporary alliance is the part of the script which defines this very pay-per-view which is called as the Survivor Series. In the meantime, there will be wrestlers who will want to challenge Reigns and Orton respectively for their respective world title and universal title. So who is the one who can challenge Reigns? Who is up to him? After Jey Uso, the only wrestler who can challenge Reigns who is as cerebral as him is his former partner, his former mate of the faction called the Shield, Seth Rollins. So Reigns and Rollins are in the same brand, different stories are being run parallelly for them. While Reigns deals with his own cousins Jay and Jimmy Uso and the whole family drama comes into the picture, Rollins has his own rivalry with his former partner Murphy and Ray and Dominic Mysterio. So even if you are on the same brand and you are former partners. It doesn't mean that you will come face to face. It is a possibility. Will they come face to face for a non-title match or a universal title match? Well, that is left to the discretion of the WWE management. But it would be a mouth-watering prospect if these two come face to face even to outdo the other. Because in this very business, anything goes and surprises are galore as far as former partners facing each other is concerned despite being the member of the same brand. But with both these wrestlers coming up with a new attitude ever since April and a new way of showing their superior skills not only as a wrestler but even as a strategist, it would be very interesting that when these two face each other, who will have the upper hand or will there be emotions overflowing if these two come face to face despite their stoic nature over the past seven months. Indeed, a very interesting prospect one is looking forward to. Reading session 1, the kite runner. On the south end of the garden in the shadows of a loquat tree was the servant's home, a modest little mud where Hassan lived with his father. It was there in that little shack that Hassan was born in the winter of 1964, just one year after my mother died giving birth to me. In the 18 years that I lived in that house, I stepped into Hassan and Ali's quarters only a handful of times. When the sun dropped low behind the hills and we were done playing for the day, Hassan and I parted ways. I went past the rose bushes to Baba's mansion. Hassan to the mud shack where he had been born where he had lived his entire life. I remember it was spare, clean, dimly lit by a pair of kerosene lamps. There were two mattresses on opposite sides of the room, a worn Hirati rug with frayed edges in between, a three-legged stool and a wooden table in the corner where Hassan did his drawings. The walls stood bare, save for a single tapestry with hewn in beads, forming the words Baba had bought it for Ali on one of his trips to Mashhad. It was in that small shack that Hassan's mother, Sonabar, gave birth to him one cold winter day in 1964, while my mother hemorrhaged to death during 
childbirth, Hassan lost his less than a week after he was born. Loss her to a fate most Afghans considered far worse than death. She ran off with a clan of traveling singers and dancers. Hassan never talked about his mother as if she had never existed. I always wondered if he dreamed about her, about what she looked like, where she was. I wondered if he longed to meet her. Did he ache for her the way I ached for the mother I had never met? One day we were walking from my father's house to cinema Zainab for a new Iranian movie taking the shortcut through the military barracks near Peak Lal Middle School. Baba had forbidden us to take that shortcut, but he was in Pakistan with Rahim Khan at that time. We hopped the fence that surrounded the barracks, skipped over a little creek and broke into the open dirt field where old abandoned tanks collected dust. A group of soldiers huddled in the shade of one of those tanks, smoking cigarettes and playing cards. One of them saw us, elbowed the guy next to him and called Hassan. Hey you, he said, I know you. We had never seen him before. He was a squatty man with a shaved head and black stubble on his face. The way he grinned at us, leered, scared me. Just keep walking, I muttered to Hassan. You, the Hazara, look at me when I am talking to you. The soldier barked. He handed his cigarette to the guy next to him, made a circle with the thumb and index finger of one hand, poked the middle finger of his other hand through the circle, poked it in and out, in and out. I knew your mother. Did you know that? I knew her real good. I took her from behind by that creek over there. Reading session 2 The Labor of Hercules. Amy Carnaby said, Miss Maltravers, of course, remember her perfectly. She was a good soul and suited Aunt Julia down to the ground. Devoted to dogs and excellent at reading aloud. Tactful too, never contradicted and invalid. What's happened to her? Not in distress of any kind, I hope. I gave her a reference about a year ago to some woman. Name began with H. Perot explained hastily that Miss Carnaby was still in her post. There had been, he said, a little trouble over a lost dog. Amy Carnaby is devoted to dogs. My aunt had a Pekingese. She left it to Miss Carnaby when she died, and Miss Carnaby was devoted to it. I believe she was quite heartbroken when it died. Oh yes, she's a good soul. Not, of course, precisely intellectual, Hercule Poirot agreed that Miss Carnaby could not perhaps be described as intellectual. His next proceeding was to discover the park keeper to whom Miss Carnaby had spoken on the fateful afternoon. This he did without much difficulty. The man remembered the incident in question. Middle-aged lady, rather stout, in a regular state, she was lost her Pekingese dog. I knew her well by sight, brings the dog along most afternoons. I saw her come in with it. She was in a rare talking when she lost it, came running to me to know if I had seen anyone with a Pekingese dog. Well, I ask you, I can tell you the gardens is full of dogs every kind terriers peaks german sausage dogs even them borzois all kinds we have not likely i would notice one peak more than another hercule poirot nodded his head 
thoughtfully. He went to 38 Bloomsbury Road Square. Numbers 38, 39 and 40 were incorporated together as the Balclava Private Hotel. Poirot walked up the steps and pushed open the door. He was greeted inside by gloom and a smell of cooking cabbage with reminiscence of breakfast kippers. On his left was a mahogany table with a sad looking chrysanthemum plant on it. Above the table was a big base covered rack into which letters were stuck. Poirot stared at the board thoughtfully for some minutes. He pushed open a door on his right. Head led into a kind of lounge with small tables and some so-called easy chairs covered with a depressing pattern of cretonne. Three old ladies and one fierce looking gentleman raised their heads and gazed at the intruder with deadly venom. Hercule Poirot blushed and withdrew. He walked farther along the passage and came to a staircase. On his right, a passage branched at right angles to what was evidently the dining room. A little way along this passage was a door marked office. On this, Poirot tapped. Receiving no response, he opened the door and looked in. There was a large desk in the room covered with papers, but there was no one to be seen. He withdrew, closing the door again. He penetrated to the dining room. A sad-looking girl in a dirty apron was shuffling about with a basket of knives and forks with which she was laying the tables. Hercule Poirot said apologetically, Excuse me, but... Could I see the manageress? The girl looked at him with lackluster eyes. She said, I don't know, I'm sure. Hercule Poirot said, there is no one in the office. Well, I don't know where she would be, I am sure. Reading Session 3, The Iliad So, Therese's taunted the famous field marshal, but Odysseus stepped in quickly, faced him down with a dark glance and threats to break his nerve. What a flood of abuse, Therese, even for you, fluent and fluent as you are, keep quiet. Who are you to wrangle with kings, you alone? No one, I say, no one alive less soldierly than you. None in the ranks that come to Troy with Agamemnon. So stop your babbling, mouthing the names of kings, bringing indecencies in their teeth. Your eyes peel for a chance to cut and run for home. We can have no idea, no clear idea at all how the long campaign will end. Whether Achaia's sons will make it home unharmed Link back in disgrace. But there you sit, hurling abuse at the son of Atreus, Agamemnon, marshal of armies, simply because our fighters give Atreus the lion's share of all our plunder, you and your ranting slander. You are the outrage. I tell you this, so help me, it's the truth. If I catch you again, blithering on this way, let Odysseus' head be wrenched off his shoulders. Never again call me the father of Telemachus. If I don't grab you, strip the clothing of you, cloak, tunic and rags that wrap your private parts and whip you howling naked back to the fast ships out of the army's muster, whip you like a cur. And he cracked the scepter across his back and shoulders. The rascal doubled over, tears streaking his face, and a bloody welt bulged up between his blades. Under the stroke of the golden scepter's studs, 
He squatted low, cringing, stunned with pain, blinking like some idiot, rubbing his tears off dumbly with a fist. Their morale was low, but the men laughed now. Good hearty laughter breaking over Hirati's head. Glancing at neighbors, they would shout. A terrific stroke, a thousand terrific strokes he carried off. Odysseus, taking the lead in tactics, mapping battle plans. But here's the best thing yet he's done for men. He's put a stop to this babbling, foul-mouthed fool. Never again, I'd say, will a gallant comrade risk his skin to attack the kings with insults. For the soldiers bantered, but not Odysseus. The raider of cities stood there, scepter in hand, and close beside him the great grey-eyed Athena rose like a herald, ordering men to silence all from the first to lowest ranks of Achaea's troops should hear his words and mark his counsel well. For the good men of all, he urged them, Agamemnon, now my king, the Achaeans are bent on making you a disgrace in the eyes of every man alive. Yes, they failed to fulfill their promise sworn that day. They sailed here from the stallion land of Argos, that not until you had raised the rugged walls of Troy would they sail home again. But look at them now, like green defenseless boys or widowed women, whimpering to each other, willing to journey back. True, they have labored long, they are desperate for home. Any fighter cut off from his wife for one month would chafe at the benches, mooning in his ship, pinned down by gales and heavy raging seas. A month, but look at us. This is the ninth year come round, the ninth we have hung on here. Who could blame the Achaeans for chafing, bridling beside the big ships? Uh, but still, what a humiliation it would be to hold out so long, then sail home empty-handed. Courage, my friends, hold out a little longer. Till we see if Calcas divined the truth or not. We all recall that moment. Who could forget it? We were all witnesses then. All, at least, the deadly spirits have not dragged away. Reading session for P.G. Woodhouse. Madeline's eyes fell on the remains. They widened to the size of golf balls and she looked at Gussie as if he had been a mass murderer she wasn't very fond of. What have you been doing to Roderick? She demanded. Huh? I said, what have you done to Roderick? Gussie adjusted his spectacles and shrugged a shoulder. Oh, that! I merely chastised him. The fellow had only himself to blame. He asked for it and I had to teach him a lesson. You brute! Not at all! He had the option of withdrawing. He must have foreseen what would happen when he saw me remove my glasses. When I remove my glasses, those who know what goods for them take to the hills. I hate you, I hate you, cried Madeline, a thing I didn't know anyone ever said except in the second act of a musical comedy. You do? Yes, I do. I love you. Then in this case, said Gussie, I shall now eat a ham sandwich. And this he proceeded to do with a sort of wolfish gusto that sent cold shivers down my spine and Madeline shrieked sharply. This is the end, she said, another thing you don't often hear. When things between two one's loving hearts have hotted up to this extent, it is always the prudent course for 
the innocent bystander to edge away and this I did. I started back to the house and in the drive I met Jeeves. He was at the wheel of Stiffy's car. Beside him, looking like a Scotch elder, the looking sin was the dog Bartholomew. Good evening, sir, he said. I have been taking this little fellow to the veterinary surgeon. Miss Bing was uneasy because he bit Mr. Fink Nottle. She was afraid he might have caught something. I am glad to say the surgeon has given him a clean bill of health. Jeeves, I said, I have a tale of horror to relate. Indeed, sir, the lute is mute, I said, and as briefly as possible put him in possession of the facts. When I had finished, he agreed that it was most disturbing, but I fear there is nothing to be done, sir. I reeled. I have grown so accustomed to seeing Jeeves solve every problem, however sticky, that this frank confession of his inability to deliver the goods unmanned me. You are baffled? Yes, sir. At a loss? Precisely, sir. Possibly at some future date a means of adjusting matters will occur to me, but at the moment I regret to say I can think of nothing. I am sorry, sir. I shrugged the shoulders. The iron had entered into my soul, but the upper lip was stiff. It's all right, Jeeves. Not your fault if a thing like this lays you a stymie. Drive on, Jeeves, I said, and he drove on. The dog Bartholomew gave me an unpleasantly superior look as they moved off, as if asking me if I were saved. I pushed along to my room, the only spot in this joint of terror where anything in the nature of peace and quiet was to be had, not that even there one got much of it. The fierce rush of life at Totalitas had got me down and I wanted to be alone. I suppose I must have sat there for more than half an hour trying to think what was to be done for the best and then out of what I have heard Jeeves describe as a welter of emotions. One coherent thought emerged and that was that if I didn't shortly get a snifter I would expire in my tracks. It was now the cocktail hour and I knew that whatever his faults Sir Watkin Basse provided aperitifs for his guests. True, I had promised Stiffy that I would avoid his society, but I had not anticipated then that this emergency would arise. It was a straight choice between betraying her trust and perishing where I sat and I decided on the former alternative. I found Pop Basse in the drawing room with a veiled laden tray at his elbow and hurried forward licking my lips. To say that he looked glad to see me would be overstating it, but he offered me a lifesaver and I accepted it gratefully. An awkward silence of about 20 minutes followed and then just I had finished my second and was fishing for the olive. Stiffy entered. She gave me a quick reproachful look and I could see that her trust in Bertram's promises would never be the same again. But it was to Pop Basset that she directed her attention. Hello Uncle Watkin. Good evening my dear. Having a sport before dinner? I am. You think you are. Said Stiffy, but you aren't, and I'll tell you why. There isn't going to be any dinner. The cooks eloped with Gussie Fink Nottle. For more awesome content, tune in to the next episode of the weekly show with Aditya.